Hi everyone, welcome to the Engineering New Zealand Lightning Talks. This one is on the fire engineering provided by the Society of Fire Protection Engineers. I'm your moderator today, Jonathan Beardmore. A bit of background from me, I have about six, seven years experience in the industry. And before that, I was a full-time student studying engineering. If you do have any questions today for any of the presenters, there is a chat, you can type them in there, I'll see them, record them. And after we have our presentations, we'll have a Q&A session for probably around 20 minutes. We have four presenters from various backgrounds in the industry. I suppose without further ado, should we just kick it off? Stephen, do you want to launch into it? Um, hello everyone and um, welcome to uh, the Lightning Talks. Um, so I'm first up, my name's Stephen Reeves. Um, I currently work for Fire and Emergency New Zealand as a fire engineer. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, I started my journey off in um, fire safety um, back in 2001 um, when I joined Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service in Liverpool, England um, as a firefighter, as a career fire firefighter. Um, and then in 2008, I decided to go to university as a mature student um, at the age of 34 uh, to study fire engineering um, part-time uh, while I also uh, worked full-time as well. And um, once I completed that in 2013, that brought me to New Zealand um, where I worked as um, a graduate fire engineer with Powell Fenwick Consultants um, in Christchurch. I um, worked for them for, for about four years and then I did two years with, or two and a half years or so with Becca in, in Tauranga. Um, and then an opportunity came to return to the fire, fire service, I guess, um, with fire and emergency as a fire engineer. Um, so that's a, a little bit about my background. Um, I'll tell you some about what we do um, a fire and emergency. Um, okay, so as I said, I work for the Fire Engineering Unit, which was set up in, in 2005. Um, and we've got about 13 fire engineers um, spread over three offices um, in Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch, although I work remotely from Tauranga, where I'm speaking uh, from today. And there's a photo of the team. <laughs> Okay, so what we do, uh, primarily we, we work as a um, regulatory type uh, function. Um, we do a lot of design reviews, um, which are required under Section 46 and 47 of the Building Act. Um, so that is when um, fire designs are submitted to local councils uh, for building consent, and they often send it to us um, for review and comment. Um, so we got you know, all various types of um, fire designs from the most rudimentary uh, through to quite complex ones. And um, we also um, act as stakeholders in the fire engineering brief process. Um, we do fire engineering design of our own buildings and fire stations as well. Um, we also do um, a, a type of fire investigation called post incident analysis where um, where a fire, in, a fire investigator from fire and emergency will request our attendance um, because some kind of um, failure of some system or other. Um, we also engage in providing technical advice um, and stakeholder liaison. Um, and we do some project, internal project work and research as well. Um, as you can see, since 2017, um, the number of design reviews that we do has increased um, quite considerably. Um, this year, uh, it's been reduced a little bit because we um, we do a, a, tri a triage type system where we send some of the more basic designs back to council with, with no comment, just because of the sheer volume of jobs that we were getting. Um, okay, as I say, we also we also um, are involved as a stakeholder in the fire engineering brief process. Um, 
which gives us an opportunity to comment at an early design stage um, during the design phase of the, the project. Um, yeah, and, and hopefully sometimes we, we, we hopefully will try to influence the design in a positive way. Um, and also it gives us an opportunity to um, provide comments um, around safety of firefighters who will come, to obviously come to the building, hopefully once everybody's evacuated. Um, okay, so as I say, we also do some of our own fire engineering design, um, mostly at fire stations around the country. Um, and other buildings, uh, office type buildings, um, and most recently we, we did the design for our own fire engineering facility at Ireland, which is um, adjacent to the University of Canterbury, um, which is also a good opportunity, or has been a good opportunity to liaise directly with the university, and I, I believe that the university staff and students um, will um, you have been using the facilities there. Um, okay, so the post instance analysis role that we do is not a um, not an origin and cause type investigation, which will already have been going on. Um, but it's one, it's an opportunity to, for us to go in and see what went wrong, what fire safety systems didn't perform as intended or as designed, um, and it allows us to. Um, you know, feedback into the industry, um, and hopefully um, everybody learns a little bit from that um, from that process. Um, we also provide technical advice. Um, a lot of it is internal um, throughout the, the, the various departments of the of fire and emergency, um, but also external as well. Um, stakeholder liaison. Um, to organisations such as MB, the SFPE, the IFE, um, universities, um, and we're also involved in the in the um, steering committees of um, the compliance documents as well, and some standards. Um, are, for example, uh, soon we'll be doing um, the firefighting code of practice on water supplies. Um, it's come back around for for review. Um, long overdue, some might say, um, and we also present uh, at conferences and seminars as well. Um, and we also do some research and project-based work, um, and some examples of those that we've done in the past is the, um, the Designers Guide to fire, Firefighting Operations, um, New Zealand Fire Fatality and Injuries, and as I said, there's the in, Soon we'll be starting the, the code of practice for firefighting water supplies as well. Okay, and that's just about wraps me up. So I'll, I'll pass over to the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. We now have Tristan from Becker, who's going to present. <coughs> just for those that have just joined us, there is a QA panel at the bottom. If you have any questions, type them in there, and once our presenters are finished, we'll have a Q&A session. Hi Tristan, sorry, it seems like your uh, sound isn't coming through there. How about now? Yeah, perfect. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Tristan Govan. I'm a consulting fire engineer for Becker. Um, just to give a quick background on things, I did the summer school course at the University of Canterbury um, in 2019. And just to give you a bit of a breakdown on what it is that what each course was back then was um, eight different courses. Structural fire engineering gave you a good background on understanding temperature limits for steel and how it behaves in fire scenarios. Um, fire safety systems looks at how your um, how uh, sprinkler systems and gas flood systems work and such. Also gives you a bit of 
Um, the way the course is taught, there's a couple of labs as well, which just gives you an idea of how long it actually takes for sprinklers to go off. Uh, fire dynamics is a very theoretical paper, which looks at just uh, heat transfer from first principles design. And then we've got advanced fire dynamics, which kind of brings it a, a bit more together, but more applicable to modeling. We do CFD modeling. We use a couple of software. One of them is a BRIS, which is two zone layer uh, model. And then we've got another one, which is um, FDS, uh, computational fluid dynamics. Uh, human behavior is another one that we take, which looks at how people is, does, it looks at things such as, you know, does panic exist? Um, how do how is a building design in terms of exits and everything influence how people react in fire situations is more information better or is less uh, fire engineering case study is a practical ap application that kind of looks at every single course together and what you're given is a building design and you go through and come up with a proper fire engineering uh, design uh, we've done it as an alternative solution where you kind of look at prescriptive methodology and performance-based methodology and you just put uh, combine them together to come up with a solution. And risk management was an elective, but it more looked at sort of probabilities and stats. It was a stats paper, unfortunately. Um, if, any, if, you guys, if anyone listening has done a Bachelor of Engineering anywhere, it's, it's very similar to a fourth year engineering course. I'd done it as a, I'd done it full-time study, so you can do it part-time study for three and a half years. Um, so why did I become a fire engineer? I couldn't actually find a job as a mechanical engineer. Um, I had heard that you become a designer essentially doing things similar to what architects did. Very different in practice what we do. Um, you get a lot of project control is what I had heard as well. And I had found out just through word of mouth from family members and such. Um, and these guys actually get paid quite a bit. But of course, as, as I'll probably mention later on, this is sort of high time, high reward sort of thing, but that's any sort of um, specialist field these days. Has my undergraduate degree helped? Absolutely. I mean, it may not be engineering either. Uh, the course actually, you could do science and allow you in. It's sort of just your understanding and what your interest lies in that kind of gets you to fire engineering is all I can find. Um, so yeah, you can either do it part-time across four years or full-time one one to two years, there is a thesis paper, a thesis course for this, which is um, you do your first year study or split it between the two while you're doing the thesis. So my life as a fire engineer is very interesting. Not a single day goes by where it's, where it's not interesting. I've always had at least four work stories per day. Um, I get to innovate cool fire safety designs. It ranges from using prescriptive methodology and it, all the way to alternatives, which pure fire engineering design, looking at how the scenarios themselves in buildings and room spaces and such. Uh, I do fire and smoke modeling as well. Um, evacuation modeling too. I have a copy break every now and then just to keep me on a high. Um, research design fires, uh, I talk to stakeholders, stakeholders are including uh, FINS, Auckland Council, and our peer review as well, as well as the client, of course, to make sure that we get their requirements and, and match that up with our fire, uh, fire engineering design. Um, another coffee break is always good, and then we coordinate with multiple disciplines. Now, that's actually the hardest part that I found in uh, as a fire engineer. So I've, I've only been doing it for about a month and eight months, but the thing is a uh, year and eight month. But the thing is because of how uh, Becker is at the moment, we're going through tri quite a transition and creating a new uh, specialist field within the company. It, it's very hard when it comes to coordinating with disciplines outside with outside companies and um, within Becker itself. Construction monitoring is also a thing that I do on a daily basis and it's either going to site or reviewing what we get from uh, external specialists. Now, there's a lot of challenges with doing it. So as I say, the disciplines, so this includes mechanical engineers and looking at where they put their fire and smoke dampers, um, electrical engineers, and it looks at what they've, where they put the exit signage or just maybe looking at security and making sure that on fire alarm, activation you know you've got your security doors that open up and allow people to egress out uh, other thing is responding to peer reviewers and fins and Auckland council questions very difficult when trying to 
uh, especially when you're trying to when you've got three different opinions maybe and you need to give three different answers you need to give you the same answer that either answers all their questions or none of them um, which becomes quite difficult models crashing as well with our CFD modeling um, it comes back to first principles how simplified do we want to make things researching design fires evacuation times this is what I do on a day to day as well that's the thing um, understanding all the different standards there's so many out there as well um, running out of time uh, the way that I see it is um, it's quite an important job to as a new fire engineer to constantly ask questions why or why not what you'll find as a fire engineer is that you've got to be very proactive in this industry and it's kind of a bit of it's a bit of an iceberg illusion where what we may present is very different to what we do in the background and essentially what we do in the background is project management to to a degree uh, we're, we're coordinating between different disciplines we're engaging with state key stakeholders that can literally shut down projects and not and any build the important thing is that any building that requires any sort of construction work a fire engineers involved so it just that sort of level of, of detail and care and what we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis makes it even more worthwhile to get into this industry. And that's just how, what I felt over the past uh, year and eight months. I think that's it. Unfortunately, I couldn't get through everything within seven minutes. Uh, I'll hand it back to Jonathan. It's okay. Carry on. Talk to the slide. It's fine. Okay. Um, yeah so why should you become a if you, why should you become a fire engineer i mean it's a very specialist field we demand everywhere in the world um it's a very strong pathway to becoming a project manager or lead you get a very high satisfaction with some of these designs i've been able to work on hospitals hotels airports um large office seven-story office buildings and such and everyone has a different dynamic to it and everyone when you look at what's right it's you sort, of, you sort of come away from these buildings going, you know what, I would want to walk into that building. I know it's a sa it's, I know it's safe. Not because I've designed it or anything. That's a bit of vanity right there. But it's more to do with the fact that um, it's not just in line with what the building code requirements are. I've considered additional options or gone above and beyond to say, look, if you want to have your, if you want to protect the property, if you want to protect the people, we've got to implement this. And as I mentioned before, it's like any job, really. It's a, it's got, it's very good pay, but it's a high time, high reward game for, uh, depending on which company you're at. Uh, that's all. I hope that uh, gives a bit of insight into uh, day in the life of a graduate fire engineer. Thank you, Tristan. That's very good. And next we have Karen, who's here to talk from Homesfire. Hi everyone, uh, yep, yeah, it's Karen Goble here from Homesfire. Um, I'm going to start off a little differently and um, aside from mentioning the main reason I got into fire engineering was because I was attracted to its diversity. I'm going to start off talking about me and I don't usually do this very much, so bear with me. Um, I, oh, sorry, I don't have my B on. There you go. There's me. Hi. Um, so I followed a fairly traditional path into engineering. I liked maths and science at school. Um, and I knew that there was this thing called engineering because my father was one. Um, but even then, I didn't really know what it was until I started working. So I went into the University of Canterbury um, the first year, not knowing what kind of engineering I would do, um, eventually deciding to do civil engineering. Um, at the end of my civil engineering degree, I had something like four job offers on the table and was struggling to commit to any one of them. Um, so despite being super close to being becoming a structural engineer, um, I happened to be looking through the university prospectus and came across the uh, description of a master's in fire engineering. And I thought, hey, this sounds pretty cool. It seems really diverse. It has a lot of different subjects that I've enjoyed during, doing during my undergraduate degree, and it doesn't feel like I'll be uh, restricting myself in future. So from there, I um, had a, an unsolicited call from 
someone who I'd been to primary school with actually um, and ended up with a job with Homes Fire um, as a fire engineer here. And I've been with Homes Fire since then. Um, so it's coming up 15 years now. I've been in Auckland for almost all of that time and um, learning a lot about the New Zealand Building Code and compliance documents. And more recently, uh, the end of last, sorry, end of 2019, I went over to our Seattle office uh, to transfer my general experience over there. Um, I found at the time that there is a lot, you know, first principles apply across the world, regardless, fire burns the same, uh, but the code do documents are very different depending on where you are, and, and Paul might touch on this later as well, I, I think. Um, so I, I, my timing was really bad. Um, I learned a bit about the codes and a bit about using feet instead of meters. Um, and COVID came along um, and for various reasons, I find myself back in Auckland, um, back in Homes Fire. Um, I often get asked when I meet new people, what, what do you actually do? And I think sometimes it's easier to say what I don't do. Um, I don't design fire engines. I don't light fires. I don't put out fires, the exception being the one in the picture that was um, a fire at the property next door to my own house. Um, and secondly, I, or sorry, lastly, I don't bury uniform. Um, in my day-to-day -day job, Tristan's kind of covered some of this already, the, um, there's a lot that we think about and do. We might do some fire and smoke modeling. We might look at um, human behavior and people movement. We might look at how quickly people get out of buildings. We might look at the performance of structure. The way that I think of it um, holistically is that structure, sorry, fire engineering is really similar to structural engineering and that a structural engineer designs a building for people to, sorry, to stand up if there is an earthquake. And a fire engineer designs a building that is safe for people to get out of if there's a fire. It's very simplified, of course, but that's generally how I think about my day to day job. So we might look at fire, combustion, smoke spread, fluid dynamics, people movement, human behavior, structure. Uh, but a lot of my job, my day to day job is liaising with people. Um, it's talking to architects. It's finding out what the client really wants. Um, it's attending meetings. It's writing reports. It's talking on the phone. It's sending emails. There's a lot of human interaction and collaboration just within the design aspect of what I do. So if someone were to ask me how much engineering do I actually do in any given day, it would be, sorry, in any given week, I think it would be less than half on, on a good week. Some of the specializations that people can get into um, are, are really quite fascinating. And a key one that we do have here in New Zealand already is the specific assessment of how structure performs in fire. So uh, how, how well is a structure going to stand up if the um, steel or the concrete has been exposed to the higher temperatures of a fire? Is it going to be able to stand up for itself or is it going to need to be protected with some kind of insulative material to help it stay up um, when there's so much heat around it? So traditionally, we have looked a lot at the performance of steel structure in fire. But increasingly, there is a lot of focus industry-wide on using mass timber for our buildings um, with a lot of focus on the sustainability of mass timber, but it actually also just feels really nice to be in a mass timber building. So it poses some interesting questions of what, what do you need to do differently if you're designing a building out of a material that fundamentally burns? So I won't, won't try to answer that question here. Um, I've had the opportunity to work on some pretty cool projects in my career so far. Um, they have typically all been commercial or similar buildings within Auckland. Um, hopefully these ones are all familiar to you. The ASB North Wharf building um, is unique in that it has effectively a really big chimney on the top. Um, what I've heard now called the either a funnel or the Smurfs underpants. Um, various other names, um, acts like a really natural chimney for any smoke that might be inside that otherwise very open building. We did also do some smoke modeling for that and it, it was also one of the very rare opportunities that we do have to light a fire, a real fire inside a building and um, 
do a, a check on whether the modeling that we've undertaken during the design is a you know, reasonable representation of how the smoke moves and do we need to reconfigure something with mechanical systems or otherwise. I've worked on some fit outs and refurbishments. The TVNZ building is a really good example of an, what was an old building that felt really enclosed and bland and there's now a very vibrant and open space. And again, there's a lot of consideration in this building for how does smoke spread through what's now a very open atrium and how quickly can people get out of that space using the egress routes they have. I've done a lot of work on Commercial Bay, both the retail development and the tower. Uh, they've all got their own unique considerations and again, a lot of interaction along the way with these, both all of these buildings, but in particular Commercial Bay, what does the client really want? How does the design change over time as potential tenants get involved in and the building um, and how do we interact and collaborate with the other designers to achieve the best outcome overall for that development. Um, I see my time is up, I'm almost done. Uh, I've also worked on residential buildings, fit outs, just about anything and everything and this is one of the key reasons that I was attracted to fire engineering, the diversity of the projects, the diversity of the subject matter, um, and also the diversity of the people that we get to work with, all of the stakeholders, Stephen mentioned earlier, whether it's the fire service, other architects, mechanical engineers, structural engineers, we get to deal with all kinds of people, a broad range of projects and a broad range of subjects. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. We now have Paul, who's joining us from the other side of the globe, all the way from England. Evening, everybody. Um, yeah, so it's 7.27 in the morning here, so I'm on to uh, coffee number two already. Um, but yeah, I suppose what I've really got is just a few slides um, with some images, just of things that I've been involved with over the years. Um, and I suppose taking it way back, um, I was just thinking about this um, last night. I first started getting involved in fire engineering in 2002 which was actually when I was at university um, and had to do a basically a summer placement as, as part of the course. Um, and so since then, I've largely only ever been involved in the, in the working world of, of fire. Um, and I think as a lot of people have uh, said already, so Tristan mentioned it and Karen mentioned it as well, the great attraction I think with fire engineering compared to perhaps some of the other disciplines is you tend to be working on multiple projects at any one time. So if you were an architect, for instance, you may, as a junior architect, be largely involved on one job day in, day out for quite a sustained period of time. Fire engineering isn't like that. I think it was Tristan's day with multiple coffee breaks that uh, you know, shows how much fire engineers bounce around between different projects, between different meetings with uh, hotel, uh, sorry, building owners, I should say. I work in hotels at the moment, so I tend to say hotels and buildings interchangeably. Um, you know, between local councils, between fire authorities, between insurers, um, between anybody that's got an interest in, in the fire space. Um, and so in my first few years, I was working in London. Um, and working in London gives you an opportunity to actually work on projects right around the world. And this was one of the more fascinating ones at the time, which is the Dubai Sports Complex, um, which was being built for the 2010 uh, Swimming World Championships. Um, so you'll often find as well with these sorts of bigger projects, there is a very hard deadline. Um, you know, you're not, you're not able to just move the Swimming World Championships to another day to, to suit. Um, but there's some, some great opportunities in terms of the sorts of buildings and, and projects that people can get involved with. After London, um, somebody said, hey, do you want to move to Denmark? Uh, we've got a tunnel project over there that we need somebody team of people really to, to go and work on. Uh, so I suppose my, my first big tip for everybody is just say yes, and then work out how to do it later, which is essentially what I did. Um, because prior to moving to Denmark, I'd never had any experience of tunnel fire safety. It is a bit of a different field to building fire safety. Um, there's a lot of specialists that work in that area. Uh, and that's in part because tunnels are a lot rarer than buildings. 
um, but also just because the complexity of the fire dynamics in a tunnel is very different to what you might experience in a building. Um, but as I say, take any and all opportunities, especially when you're starting up. Um, there's so many different paths that you can go down that it's worth exploring all the different routes um, and just seeing what suits you know, each individual each individual best. And so after after Denmark, it was about 2010. Um, and so for those who are old enough to remember, I'm feeling a bit old now, there was um, the global financial crisis going on. And so we had an opportunity to move back to London, but it was all a bit doom and gloom at the time in terms of the, the economy and things. So we essentially just took the opportunity to try something completely different um, and moved over to New Zealand. Um, and so I actually lived in New Zealand for seven years, split between Auckland and Christchurch. And a lot of the work that I did in New Zealand was across the building space, um, wide variety of, of, of building types, but especially around airports. Um, so there's a few pictures up on the screen at the moment of um, mostly Auckland airports. So top right is Wellington, which you might recognize from the timber structures that they've, that they've got there. Um, but a lot of my work was in Auckland airport. And I think one of the things in fire that's quite attractive as, as well is that once you get stuck into a client or a, a building or a, or a campus, you know, it could be a, an education campus, it could be a hospital campus, it could be an airport, jobs just keep coming on. Clients are always evolving what their buildings are doing, um, trying to maximize the use of the space or just responding to what's going on around them. So for instance, I'm sure Auckland Airport at the moment will be looking what are they going to be doing come next year when potentially travel opens up in New Zealand, but you'll likely have a green lane for safe countries and a red lane for those which are perceived to be a little bit more risky. And so all those sorts of things you require planning. And when it comes to doing those modifications to a building, you always have to consider the fire implications of it as well. And then in 2017, uh, we moved back to the UK and we, we moved up to Manchester. Um, and having worked with Auckland Airport and having got stuck into one sort of large client, it was the sort of thing that I was, I was still looking to do. So I joined a consulting firm in the UK and one of the bigger projects that I ended up working on was Manchester Town Hall, which is the images that you can see on the screen. And I think as Karen noted earlier, you know, codes are different all over the world. It took a little while to get my head around the UK standards again from the New Zealand standards. Um, but fundamentally, fire performs in the same way wherever you are. Um, so it's really just understanding the local dynamic um, and, and, and essentially how the industry has evolved over the years. But essentially with, with Manchester Town Hall, it's a fascinating building because it was, it was originally built in 1877. Uh, so it's, it's nearly 150 years old. And, you know, at the time it wasn't built with any modern standards in mind. Um, and I suppose just as an example of how fire interacts with lots of other things, uh, one of the requirements when that building was originally built was that it was above street level to make it a little bit grander. I suppose to keep the, the, the government officials away from the, uh, the general public. Um, that obviously has a massive conflict with accessibility today um, because it's above street level. Typically in the past, it would have been steps and the like. And so there was a huge overlap between fire and accessibility to make sure that anybody who needed assistance evacuating the building could do so um, in the event of a fire, as well as any able-bodied person was able to do. And then finally, sort of bringing up to date, um, I now work for IHG Hotels and Resorts. Um, and this isn't necessarily a pitch of our hotels, but it is um, a point that I suppose I didn't know we had half those brands before I started at IHG. Um, and my role at IHG is essentially looking after brand, what we call brand safety, um, which is basically fire, uh, all other aspects of safety, and also security considerations as well. And like any other space within fire, it sort of gets you around the world. Um, and so this is one of our, I suppose, flagship intercontinentals, which is just outside Shanghai, um, built in an old quarry. So you can sort of imagine the complexities of trying to develop not just a fire engineering strategy for that hotel, but every other aspect of it as well. Um, and if you can remember way back to the, to the title of the presentation, a lot of the rooms are also built underwater. 
So this is one of the main function spaces, um, but there are also guest rooms and the like that are, that are built underwater. So essentially your window is, is a large fish tank into the quarry. Um, and so I think, you know, the biggest headache I have in, in hotels at the moment is because I work across so many different countries, it is keeping all those codes in my head at once. Um, and, you know, it, it is just a, a fascinating area to work in, um, especially when you're dealing with, with some countries which don't have such developed fire codes. So I would say, you know, if you do have the opportunity, you know, probably not this year with the pandemic going on, uh, but in the future to, to travel around and experience different countries' attitudes to fire engineering, then it's definitely something that's worthwhile doing. I can see that uh, Tristan's already commenting on Auckland Airport, so maybe that's the time to head into questions. So perhaps I'll just pass back to Jonathan. Thank you, Paul. A series of good presentations. I'll now invite the four speakers to put their cameras on and we'll get into some Q&A. Just a reminder, if anyone has any questions as we go through this, just pop them in the chat and we'll get to them. So the first question we have is a film more directed at Stephen. Are Fire and Emergency New Zealand post-incident analysis reports publicly available? Um, well, all of our all of our documentation is publicly available via a um, official um, information request. Um, but I think unless the the post uh, post incident analysis report is required for some kind of legal, um, you know, like a, a court case or something like that, where it may be uh, not publicly available at that time, uh, eventually it will be. Um, but generally, they're not uh, involved in in court cases, and, and it's just uh, an opportunity for for people to learn from. So yeah, they are but they are publicly available. Thank you, Stephen. The next question we have, Phil. Everyone can have a crack at answering. Uh, is there anything you wish you knew before choosing this career, uh, Stephen? Should we start off with you again? Um. Yeah, well, um, something I didn't mention in my uh, presentation is why did I choose uh, fire engineering? It was actually, I didn't go to university or, or any kind of higher education when I should have done, when I was a, a young person. Um, so I arrived at a stage in my life where I thought, I think I should get some education in my life. And um, so I looked down a list of a prospectus at a university and I thought, oh, that fire engineering thing looks kind of related to what I'm doing at the moment, which was firefighting, and it totally isn't. Um, but, um, yeah, I think I, I probably should have made myself a little bit more aware of what the job actually entailed before diving um, head, head first into the course. Well, no regrets, though. Just on, do you want to go next? Is there anything you wish you knew before choosing this career? Just on, are you there? I think, I, think uh, again, I, I think one of the biggest things that I didn't quite understand or even come across was um, the power of diplomacy. Uh, when you're talking with all the different um, disciplines and when you're talking with stakeholders and even just people in your own team, um, it's really easy to blurt out certain things when you got to realize when it's like um, you can't be too standoffish or anything. The the best fire engineers that I've, I've seen to have met in, uh, in my limited experience are the ones that you could ask them a question and they'll be like, hmm, okay. Um, let's take a step back and start run through this, you know, step by step. I guess it's just communication. It's the communication is a bit different, I found, as a consulting fire engineer compared to if you were to be a just a, a if you were to be a consulting mechanical engineer because uh, I did mechanical. Um, it was is very different in the sense that um, it's a different level of risk involved, which I think is what causes people to actually talk differently and maybe write things differently. Uh, that would be the only thing that I wish I knew a bit more about because it's it's quite uh, the Becker fire team at Auckland started off with nine at the beginning of last year it's three at the moment we've got more people coming in uh, on board over the next few months which is great but I've been able to kind of step up and it's just been really interesting to learn stuff on the job with the fact that 
I have zero diplomacy skills. <laughs> so communication is probably the thing that is a bit different for fire engineering, is what I found. Thank you, Tristan. Karen? Yeah, I thought it would be good to just tap into that um, because a lot of what I do is talking with other people um, and a lot of what I do isn't trying to solve a problem necessarily. It's trying to figure out what is the problem and finding out what is the problem comes about from a whole lot of discussion with a whole lot of stakeholders finding out, can the architect move that door or make it, make it wider? Can we have an extra stair? Can the mechanical engineer have some smoke extract capability in their system? These might influence how I then go about solving a problem. So you need to, there's a lot of information gathering and discussion before you can figure out what it is that you need. So yes, part of it is diplomacy, but part of it is simply being able to have those conversations and ask the question why why are you wanting to do this? So if I go back to the original question was, what do I wish I knew at the time um, before I became a fire engineer? One was perhaps that there is so much communication and collaboration involved. Um, I mean, I think it's a good thing. I really enjoy it. It took a while to get used to it. Um, related to that is I feel like a fire engineer is um, a jack of all trades and a master of one. You have to know a little bit about everything. You have to know enough about a mechanical system to be able to have that conversation. You have to know enough about how a structure performs to know what holds which bits up, to know which bits need to have protection applied to this. You need to know enough about architecture to know what words to use, what are the things that can feasibly change, how does detailing work. So you have to know all of that as well as mastering the art of putting it all together. So I think in, within our own company, we're often referred to as the ones who practice the black art. And I think that that's a fair, fair description in some respects. Um, so something else that I didn't know before I became a practicing fire engineer was just how much of a leader New Zealand has been in the world in the past in fire engineering. And that's um, largely driven by being able to test out as a performance based building code um, with since you know since 2012 when that first came out there's been a number of different iterations about how we go about doing design but in many countries you wouldn't be able to even start doing some of the designs that we do in new zealand you would be simply told this is what you have to build you have to have this many stairs you can't possibly have an atrium so in new zealand we have all of that flexibility that i didn't appreciate at the time thank you karen and Paul, last but not least. Yes, so well, they've said everything there. No, I think um, the one word I noted down uh, for that question was diversity, and I think Karen touched on it quite a lot. It's a much bigger field than I think I ever appreciated. Um, you know, you're not just dealing with fire safety in a building and sort of working in a small, isolated bubble. Um, there are so many different aspects to, to get involved with um and you know i think if i'd known that before uh it, it would have only been a another positive reason to, to get into fire um i think in many ways i sort of went in a bit blind as a as a student summer placement um but sort of quickly learned how broad the field is um, and so i think it is important to remember that when you're sort of weighing up options against some other disciplines which can be a bit more narrow depending on what sort of company or industry, part of that industry that you work in. Thank you everyone. And before I launch the next question, we have been asked if there are any groups, communities or organisations recommend joining as, joining as students. At the bottom of the chat we've added in a link to the Society of Fire Protection Engineering membership types. As a full-time student you can become a student member and Again, a raft of benefits. The next question is for Paul and Karen, you might have some input here from your work overseas. But it says, Paul, I see you have traveled a lot. Is there anything I should be doing now to help my skills be transferable or is it standard worldwide? So I think the only thing I can say about that is to just remain open-minded. Um, as I alluded to, 
things are done differently in different countries, even though fire is fundamentally the same. Um, and you know, you'll you will see it quite a lot uh, with uh, fire engineers working in the US. If you look at some of the more sort of global forums, if somebody asks a question, they will immediately go to the US codes and say, this is the answer. Um, and so I think trying to be open-minded in everything that you do from a fire perspective, not only means that you understand how things culturally work within a country or region, but also means that your designs turn out to be a lot better because you're not having that narrow view of the problem and you're taking a much bigger overview of the problem and finding the best solution for that problem based on all of the knowledge and experience that you learn over the years. Um, I think my, you know, the, the one that's vexing me at the moment is we're trying to open a new hotel in, in France. And Stephen, you can cover your ears for this one if you like. The fire service in France hold all the cards when it comes to fire safety. And their mantra is basically, if you don't do what we want you to do, we won't give you the license to open the hotel. And quite frankly, it could be it could be anything. The regulations go out the window. Um, and so just knowing in France that you can't fight against that system, you have to work with that system, um, which is you know, a very, very different approach to what you find in New Zealand, which has a more structured regulatory approach that's based on demonstrable compliance with the regulations rather than the whims of a particular fire officer on, on a Tuesday morning, depending on what kind of socks he's decided to put on. Awesome, thank you, Paul. Anyone else have anything to add? The same. Um, my experience of moving over to the US is relatively recent. Um, I, I thought I was a pretty experienced fire engineer um, and I got there and I felt like I knew nothing. Um, and it, of course, depends on which projects you're working on and what kind of questions you're getting. What I really mean is that I knew nothing about the code. So if someone had a very specific code question, I couldn't answer that question. But if someone came to me and wanted the concept, the overall concept for a new building, I could absolutely provide input on that. I would know which questions to ask um, to try to find out, you know, what are we trying to achieve? Who needs to do what? What are we working with? Someone else might have needed to do the code base work for me, but definitely that overall um, experience and skill in knowing generally what what things are important for fire safety, that's transferable worldwide. Thank you, Karen. Uh, next question is for everyone. What is the proudest project you've been involved in? Stephen, should we start with you? Um, so Jordan, my uh, so I was consult uh, working as a consulting engineer for about seven years, six and a half years. Um, so I could guess my um, the project I was most proud of would be the University of Waikato building in Durham Street in Tauranga, um, which I joined back at in the towards the tail end of the design phase of that that particular project. But what it meant was that, that the, the person that uh, was doing the design uh, left. Uh, he's a, a British guy, well, a Welsh guy. I don't want to say he's British, I'll get upset. Um, he went back to Wales. Um, so that meant that I took over the uh, the whole of the construction phase. Um, so all those skills that Karen was, um, was, was talking about earlier on, about knowing a little bit about the electrical design and the mechanical design and, and the other disciplines. Um, I, I learned a, a hell of a lot of things just working on that, that project during the construction phase. Um, so yeah, so that, that's, that's a project that stands out in my mind. Yes, Dan, what is the proudest project you've been involved in? I can't, I don't, I don't know if I should say it. I, proud of any of the projects that I work on because none of the projects I worked on have been mine per se they've all been handover projects um, I guess one of the coolest ones that I am quite proud of is um, there's a central plant and tunnel building that's been done for um, the ADHB up here at Auckland and what it is is it basically is a new plant building and it's for just for plant your services and everything and it connects into a tunnel and for it the whole point of it is for future proofing the 
hospital when they build new buildings and bust down some of the old ones they all tie into the services tunnel and eventually it'll serve it'll become sort of a ring loop tunnel service with maybe another plant building that pops up on the other side um, and that's quite and I, I think that's quite a cool concept itself just to get rid of having to have individual plant spaces in other buildings um, and I'm quite proud of it because the coordination that I had to do for that taught me a lot in terms of uh, trying to cross my I's and dot my T's when it comes to looking at different construction types you don't just have concrete you have sort of this other concrete uh, this other lightweight material was a Korok speed wall or when you're looking at uh, different fire suppression systems that you might have in there and it's more talking with external structural fire engineers with fire protection engineers and everything and I'm quite proud with the fact that I, I know looking at it that I've done not just I've gone above and beyond and sort of trying to make sure everything's coordinated uh, to the fact that some of my seniors have been like why are you looking into this you know it's outside of scope but then it kind of links into what uh, Karen mentioned before on uh, we're kind of jack of all trades. We should have an understanding of everything to provide that guidance in every single uh, area. So I'm quite proud of being part of that project, Central uh, ADHB Central Plant Tunnel Project. Interesting. Sounds very interesting. Karen, of all the projects you've worked in, which one are you most proud of, or what are the what's one of the main highlights? A commercial bay. Um, it's a very large, epic um, centre point project in Auckland. Um, I spent several years of my working life focused not entirely on that project, but, but heavily on it. Um, there were a lot of stakeholders to juggle. There were a lot of complex design issues to resolve. The, um, the client brief evolved a number of times over the project and therefore our design needed to adjust as well so that for me all culminating in a project that has been constructed and is being used maybe not right now since we're in lockdown but is being used and it is looking great and, and it's a you know, very successful project that everyone in Auckland can be you know, admiring and using so that that for me was a a real highlight to see that through and, and see it end as a successful project with everything sort of coordinated and the client extremely happy with the building they've got. Thank you, Karen. Paul, you had some very interesting projects from your presentation, but is there one that you're most proud of? What I mentioned at the time was that when I moved over to Denmark, the Danish government were essentially running a competition to build a connection um, and they had in mind that it would be a bridge but they for I suppose uh, public money reasons um, also wanted to explore other options and so if you at the time read Wikipedia it was that it's going to be a bridge the Danish people love bridges it was guaranteed to be a bridge and there's no way it could be a tunnel because you know why, why would a tunnel ever be better than a bridge? And so I think one of the great things on that project was because the tunnel was essentially the underdog as far as the design was concerned, everybody had to work very, very hard to demonstrate that in all aspects it was better than a bridge solution. Um, and so one of those was, of course, safety. Um, you know, if, you, if you look at safety, certainly in a tunnel, fire is a big issue. Fire is less of an issue generally on a bridge. Um, but on a bridge, there are other safety issues that need to be considered, namely the weather, uh, which is a big consideration, but also ships. Um, and there's quite a history of, of large ships through that area running into bridge pylons and the like. Um, and so it was, you know, it was a great opportunity to, to sort of stretch everything um, to demonstrate that overall the tunnel was a better solution from a cost perspective, from an environmental perspective, from a safety perspective. Um, and the fact that we managed to turn the public opinion around to it being a tunnel, and that's what's under construction now, was probably one of the best things about that particular project. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next question in for everyone. Probably made of an interesting question, but what are things you don't like about your job? 
We mix up the order and Karen, do you want to go first? The, um, some of the challenges we have with coordination or, or bureaucracy in some cases where it can be difficult to get agreement for all, from all parties for all sorts of different reasons. Um, it might be from a regulatory point of view, it might be from a different designer in the team. Um, and so I think trying to resolve some of those differences of thought or goals when not everyone is always engaged in the communication, that can be quite challenging. So if you've got a project where everyone is on board with communicating openly and actively, those ones are really successful. It doesn't always happen. Definitely sounds tough. Tristan, is there, what, what are the things you don't like about your job? And is people not taking ownership for certain things? Um, if a problem or issue arises, you have people not taking ownership and going, well, what am I supposed to do about it? Or you might write up something and say, look, this is a non-compliance issue. Uh, and they, you guys need to go sort it out. You provide all the guidance and everything, and you get back a week later wondering where it is. And they decide to say, oh, well, I didn't expect, I, I thought you were going to do it. Um, but what we've done is sort of, as part of the whole Jack Trades thing, we've directed them into the right location, into the place where to look, and yet they're refusing to go any further or going, look, you've done, come this far, why don't you continue with it? And it's outside of our scope. Um, and then as it, we start digging into it, you might come across a comment saying, this is how we've always done it. Uh, why haven't we picked up on this before? It's the sort of ideology that since we've done it this way before, we should continue just doing it. There's no, I guess, incentive for anyone to want to constantly improve things. Um, and that's quite a common problem that we come across with architects, actually. Um, architects will look at what they're doing now. Um, we'll present it as saying, look, we want to be more conservative, or we want to show that we need to be more protective in these areas here because of recent things that maybe fire service might release or something has happened around the world. And they'll say, well, we didn't do this on a project six months ago. Well, a lot can change in six months. So the idea is that um, and, and if we look at it in just terms of in, in New Zealand itself, it's fire engineering has been on the rise, um, steep rise in the past 20 years. Uh, we're doing some really groundbreaking stuff here um, in NZ across all, all companies really. So the fact is that just this very little ownership and wanting to change is the most difficult thing. And it's not just external parties, it's also your engineers in-house that you constantly do coordination with uh, improving the solutions on it because it's kind of a sort of a not my monkey, not my circus kind of thing. And, and I, I find that really challenging, not very, um, I, I don't like that when it comes to people t telling me that. I, I really just go, you, can, you can't say anything, unfortunately. Um, but that's what I want to change in industry as well. So I guess I'm trying to turn that into a positive. What if I don't like? I'm writing it down and going, well, next time I come across this person, let's see if I can change his mind or do something to come up with something that makes them go think twice. Thank you, Tristan. Stephen, what are the things you yeah. don't like about your job other than you're not in France where you have all the power? <laughs> Oh yeah. yeah, well I think I'll, uh, I'll sign up for some French lessons I think and uh, make the move, get some power. Nah, um, I'd say that um, rather than something that I don't like, I mean I guess there's, there's little things that I don't like about my job that I probably don't really, they're not major enough for me to share here but um, I, I'm, I'll flip it around a little bit and, and, and um, talk about something that I miss I suppose from from working as a consultant is um, that I don't do much of here um, is you know having day-to-day -day involvement in, in design decisions I suppose um, and taking ownership of a, of a project um, so <clears throat> from, from start to finish so I think that's probably something that I miss. Um, that said though, um, being involved at, at Fire and Emergency, we, we, we are kind of involved in 
or exposed to um, many, many, many projects uh, over the course of a year. Um, many more than that you could possibly um, be involved in as a consultant because, um, you know, just because of the time. And when I say I'm involved in from, from this side of the fence, I mean, um, we review things so we can see what other people are doing, um, all the cool stuff that you guys are all doing. Um, you know, so um, this, I'll, I'll say that I learned quite a bit while I've been here just by reviewing and being involved as a stakeholder in, in the design process. Thank you, Stephen. Paul, what are things you don't like about your job? This will be the last question. Huge amount of difference of opinion in the fire industry. Um, Tristan noted the, the we've always done it this way brigade. Um, and then, you know, the the clients and, and owners that have particular mindsets on things. Um, and so it, it's it's quite a source of suppose, frustration, the, the lost hours spent trying to get everybody in the same page. Um, and, you know, I think in, in, in some instances, you're sort of staring down the barrel of a very lengthy, almost PR campaign to try and get everybody to the same position. And just thinking, geez, if everyone would just get on board with this, we could move on and get onto something a little bit more useful and um, uh, you know, not spend a lot of time discussing a point that we all sort of know where we're going to get to at the end. But everybody needs to have that warm, cuddly feeling that they've been brought along for the journey. So I think it's that it's that big politics piece. And um, you know, I think Karen mentioned half a probably more than half a job is is communicating with people rather than actually doing sort of engineering maths, if you like. Um, and so that you know, is a big, a big part of it. So it's not necessarily that I don't like it because I'm you know, a bit belligerent in that sense and I'll, I'll quite happily go up against people. Um, but it's just that frustration that things could move faster and, and better if the politics were taken out of the, out of the picture. Yeah, so I just wanted to extend on that a little further. I don't think that this is peculiar or particular to fire engineering. I think that all types of engineering and probably all disciplines in the design process would say more or less the same thing. Um, so I guess my message in this forum is don't take that as a deterrent against fire engineering. I suspect that we might see more of it because we're the black art and you know people uh, it is still relatively new as an industry, even though we're you know well progressed and have been doing it for many years. It is still relatively new, um, and it is still less well defined what the answer might be than you might expect in other types of engineering. And so I think for that reason, it it almost encourages people to think that they they know what the answer should be, or to think that they should be able to decide what the answer is. So I don't think it's particular to fire engineering. I think we perhaps see a bit more of that um, communication and, and discussion aspect than others. Thank you all. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for us this evening. So I'd just like to take a quick moment to thank all of our presenters for taking time out of their busy schedules. Uh, just, you'll take a virtual bow and we'll have a virtual round of applause. But if anyone in the audience does have any other questions, you can get in contact with Engineering New Zealand and they'll send you on someone who can help out. Other than that, thank you all for attending. It's been a pleasure. Awesome.